James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So James has a sober admonition for those who would become teachers in the church. They must take the responsibility seriously because their accountability is, is greater and they shall receive a stricter judgment. All right, This is why we take the word of God very seriously. And so it is easy to take the position of teacher lightly in the church, especially today, without considering its cost in terms of accountability. In Luke 12, verse 48, Jesus warned, To whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much have been committed, of him they will ask the more. And so the words of Jesus and James is going to remind us that being among the teachers in God's church is more than just a matter of having natural or even spiritual gifts. There is an additional dimension of appropriate character and right living. So James found that this department of church work had become extremely popular, hence his warning about its serious responsibilities. God will judge us on the last day with special strictness on account of our influence over others. If you're going to take the name of the king, you better do it correctly in, in terms of representing him as an ambassador. And so therefore, teachers were both tested more and would be judged more strictly. <clears throat> And so their case is going to be different. You know, they shall receive greater condemnation than common sinners. Uh, they have not only sinned in thrusting themselves into that office, which God has never called them, but through their insufficiency, the flocks over whom they have assumed the mastery perish for the lack of knowledge. And their blood will God require at the watchman's hand. These are those non-believers that are out there preaching false doctrines, cults, and whatnot leading many people astray and doing a lot of damage as they do it. And so the comparative adjective greater or stricter implies degrees of treatment at the judgment seat. And so the greater accountability of teachers is especially sobering in light of our common weaknesses. After all, we all stumble in many things. The ancient Greek word translated stumble does not imply a fatal fall, but something that trips us up and hinders our spiritual progress. So James included himself among those who stumble, yet he did not excuse his or our stumbling. We know that we all stumble, but we should all press on to a better walk with the Lord, marked by less stumbling. And this is another of the several statements in the Bible which tell us that all men sin, uh, also including 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, which says, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, Job 14, verse 4, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Proverbs 20, verse 9, Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And uh, verse 10 as well, if we, have say we, uh, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so James provided a way to measure spiritual maturity for teachers and for all Christians. Jesus demonstrated in Matthew 12, verse 34 through 37, that words are the revelation of the inner character. And Matthew 12 will say, Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So to not stumble in word shows true spiritual maturity. This is especially relevant to teachers, who have so much more opportunity to sin with their tongue. So we stumble in word about ourselves with our boasting, exaggeration, and selective reporting. And uh, we stumble in word about others with our criticism, gossip, slander, cruelty, two-facedness, anger, or with flattery and insincere words meant to gain favor. Verses 3-6 through six. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. But also, look at ships. 
Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, and sets on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire by hell. So a small bit in the mouth controls a strong horse, a small rudder turns a large ship. Even so, if we have control over our tongue, it is an indication that we have control over ourself. Whoever can control the tongue can bridle the whole body in James chapter 3 verse 2. So the bit and the rudder are small, but they're extremely important. If they are not controlled, the entire horse is out of control or the entire ship is out of control. So it's possible for something as small as the tongue to have tremendous power for either good or evil. And you don't solve the problem of an unruly horse by keeping it in a barn or the problem of a hard-to-steer ship by keeping it tied to the dock. In the same way, even a vow of silence is not the ultimate answer for the misuse of our tongue. And so if the tongue is like the bit in the mouth of a horse or rudder on a ship, it leaves us with the question, who or what holds the reins or who or what directs the rudder? Some people have no hand on the reins or rudder and therefore say whatever comes to mind. Others direct their tongue from their emotions or from aspects of their carnal nature. And James points us towards having the Spirit of God working through the new man, setting directing hands on the reins and rudder that is our tongue. And so the fire of the tongue has been used to burn many. Children are told, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But that child's rhyme isn't really true. The bitter pain of a word spoken against us can hurt us for a lifetime long after a broken bone has healed. So what others say to us and what we say to others can last a long time for good and for evil. The casual, sarcastic, or critical remark can inflict a lasting injury on another person. The well-timed encouragement or compliment can inspire someone for the rest of their life. And Proverbs is going to speak of the person who doesn't consider the destructive power of his words. In Proverbs 26, verse 18 and 19, we'll say, Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. So again, James isn't telling us to never speak or to take a vow of silence. In many ways, that would be easier than exercising true self-control over the tongue. The bridle, the rudder, and the fire can all do tremendous good when they're controlled properly. So there isn't many sins that don't involve talking in some way. It is though all the wickedness in the world were wrapped up in that little piece of flesh, the tongue. And so James is going to echo the testimony of Proverbs regarding the tongue. In Proverbs 10 verses 19 through 21 will say, In the multitude of words sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. In Proverbs 12 verse 25, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Proverbs 16 verse 24, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Proverbs 18 verse 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Verse 7 and 8, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So a wild animal can be more easily tamed than the tongue. In fact, James tells us that no man can tame the tongue. So the human spirit has incredible capacity for sacrifice and self-control. Sometimes we hear a desperate survival story of someone who cuts off their own leg to get free from a tree that has fallen on them, and then they make it to the hospital for medical treatment, yet that same man can't tame the tongue perfectly. And so nevertheless, the tongue can be brought under the power and the control of the Holy Spirit. We might say that only God himself is mightier than the human tongue. And so the untamable tongue is even more dangerous when we consider the deadly poison it can deliver. Verse 9 through 12. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear frigs? figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. 
So the tongue can be used for the highest calling to bless our God, and it can be used for the lowest evil to curse men. In those who are born again, it shouldn't be said that out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursings. So Peter's tongue confessed Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and denied Jesus with curses. John said, "Little children love one another," and he said he wanted uh, and he wanted to say the word to bring down fire from heaven upon the Samaritan village. So our speech should be consistently glorifying to God. We shouldn't use one vocabulary or one tone of speaking at church and a different one at home or on the job. So like a spring of water, our mouth shouldn't send forth fresh and bitter from the same opening. So James is going to point to the ultimate impossibility of such contradiction. Uh, If bad fruit and bitter water continue to come forth, it means that there is no contradiction. The tree is bad and the spring is bad. And so Jesus taught in Matthew 12, verse 34 through 37, that a man's words are a reliable revelation of his inner character. So what we say can indicate what we are. And Matthew 12 will say... You know, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart and mouth speaks, right? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And so, unless you are, uh, unless you are regenerated, born from above by a new and heavenly birth, you're not Christians. Whatever you may be called, and you cannot produce the fruit which is acceptable to God any more than a fig tree can produce olive berries. You can label a fig tree olive tree, and that will not make it an olive tree. You can trim a tree to look like an olive tree, but that won't make it an olive tree. You can treat a fig tree like an olive tree, but that won't make it an olive tree. You can surround a fig tree with many olive trees, and that will not make it an olive tree. And you can transplant that fig tree to the Mount of Olives, and that would not make it an olive tree either. Verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. So at the beginning of chapter 3, the author addressed those who were teachers and wanted to be teachers among Christians. There he told such teachers how they should talk. Here he speaks about how they should live. And so James is going to address the person who is wise and understanding. The word sophos or wise was a technical term among the Jews for the teacher, scribe, and rabbi. It appears that the author is still speaking to those who would be teachers in James chapter 3 verse 1. And so here it is not what they say he's concerned with, but rather how they live. So wisdom is not mere head knowledge. Real wisdom and understanding is going to show in our lives by our good conduct. So in this sense, wisdom and understanding are like faith. They're invisible inner qualities. If a person considers himself to be wise or understanding, then it is fair to expect that this invisible inner quality would show itself in regular life. Here, James told us how to judge if a person really is wise and understanding. So true wisdom is also evident by its meek manner. Those who do their good works in a way designed to bring attention to themselves show that they lack true wisdom. So on meekness, uh, protes is gentleness, but not a passive gentleness growing out of weakness or resignation. It is an active attitude of deliberate acceptance. Verse 14 through 16. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So these uh, bitter envy and self-seeking, these are opposites of the meekness of wisdom that's mentioned in verse 13. These words actually refer to someone who has a critical, contentious, and fight-provoking manner. Uh, It is out of keeping with temper, with bitter jealousy and rivalry, or a party spirit, selfish ambition, or factiousness. All right, do not pride yourselves on that, on the intensity and harsh zeal which lead to such unscrupulous partisanship, which are sometimes justified as loyalty to the truth. So anyone who shows bitter envy and self-seeking should not deceive anyone, especially themselves, about how wise they are. They show a wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Their wisdom is more characteristic of the world, the flesh, and the devil than of God. And so this wisdom that James referred to was not really wisdom at all. It is the wisdom claimed by the would-be teachers of verse 14 whose lives are going to contradict their claims. Such wisdom, so to speak, evaluates everything by worldly standards and makes personal gain life's highest goal. So earthly is like having this life only in view. Sensual is an animal having uh, 
for its object the gratification of the passions and animal propensities and demonic uh, demon inspired by demons and maintained in the soul by their indwelling influence and so confusion and every evil thing this is the fruit of human earthly wisdom the wisdom of the world the flesh and the devil may be able to accomplish things but always the ultimate fruit of confusion in every evil thing verse 17 and 18 but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace so god's wisdom also has fruit james here defined exactly what he meant by the meekness of wisdom in verse 13 and so the character of this wisdom is wonderful. It's full of love and a giving heart, consistent with the holiness of God. This wisdom is first pure. The reference is not to sexual purity, but the absence of any sinful attitude or motive. The wisdom is then peaceable. This is one of the great words of character description in the New Testament. In the Septuagint, it is used mostly of God's disposition as a king. He is gentle and kind, although in reality he has every reason to be stern and punitive towards men in their sin. And this wisdom is gentle. The man who is epikes is the man who, sh who knows when it is actually wrong to apply the strict letter of the law. He knows how to forgive when strict judge, uh, justice gives him a perfect right to condemn. So it is impossible to find an English word to translate this quality. Right, so it's uh, some will call it sweet reasonableness, and it is the ability to extend to others the kindly consideration that we would wish to receive ourselves. And this wisdom is willing to yield, not stubborn or obstinate, of a yielding disposition in all different things. So conciliatory, only here used in the New Testament, is the opposite of stiff and unbending. So this wisdom is also full of mercy. It does not judge others strictly on the basis of the law, but will extend a generous hand full of mercy. This wisdom knows that the same measure of mercy we grant to others is the same measure that God will use with us. In Matthew 7, verse 2, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So this wisdom is full of good fruits. The wisdom can be seen by the fruit it produces. It isn't just the inner power to think and talk about the things the right way. It is full of good fruits. And it's uh, also without partiality or without judging, either a curious inquiring into the faults of others to find a matter for censures. And the wisdom is without hypocrisy or without pretending to be what it is not, acting always in its own character, never working under a mask, uh, seeking nothing but God's glory, and using no other means to attain it than those of his own prescribing. And so these last two words, without partiality and without hypocrisy, rule out the habit of using speech to half reveal and half conceal the mind of the speaker, who has something, as we say, at the back of his mind all the time. And so now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. And so this fruit is like a seed that will bear fruit as it is sown by those who make peace. The fruit of righteousness, either the fruit we bring forth, which is righteousness itself, in uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, which says, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Uh, Romans 6, verse 22, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So the fruit we, uh, we reap, which is the re reward of righteousness or eternal life. And so far from being theoretical and speculative, James' concept of wisdom is thoroughly practical. It is the understanding and attitude that result in true piety and godliness.